So the audience and distinguished experts, Professor Charles Jello and Akila Radhakrishnan, I'm honored to welcome you all at this first in a series of three expert meetings on the different aspects of treaty making processes. But first, a few housekeeping points. One is the session is being recorded. And two is you can see the chat function is open. If any one of you is having technical difficulties, please let our team know in the chat. And if you have any questions, please add them to the chat. And at the end, we might be able to answer a few. Uh, following Dr. McQuaig's call for action at the G7 2021 annual summit, the McQuaig Foundation launched the Redline Initiative, a global campaign to explore the need for an international convention for the elimination of the use of sexual violence in conflict, including its use as a method of warfare. The Redline Initiative is rooted in the belief that sexual violence in conflict and as a method of warfare represents a violation of our shared humanity that can no longer be accepted as an unfortunate but unpreventable part of armed conflict. The importance of addressing this cannot be overstated. Sexual violence in conflict destroys not only the individual victims, but their family ties, it disrupts the social fabric of communities, social norms, and inflicts harm over generations. In addition, sexual violence used as a method of warfare is also a method to carry out other international crimes and is a recognized early warning sign of the risk that those crimes might occur. Yet, despite this devastating impact, Early warning and prevention efforts remain fragmented. States are not held responsible and survivors are too often left without assistance or reparations. The Red Line Initiative seeks to address these systematic deficiencies through the creation of an international instrument that draws a red line against the use of sexual violence in conflict, including as a method of warfare, and aims to establish a clear framework for strong and timely action. For the past eight months, the Redline Initiative team has undertaken various extensive consultations with leading experts to better refine the exact nature of the current legal and enforcement gaps. From that process, developing an in-depth understanding of the international treaty making process, including lessons learned from recent and ongoing efforts with respect to other proposed international instruments has been identified as a key priority. It is with this in mind, we have organized with the financial support of the UK government's FCDO office a series of expert meetings on the following three aspects. The first one, and that's the session we will be having today, will give an overview of the United Nations treaty development processes with a particular focus on the role of the ILC, the International Law Commission. The second expert meeting will give an overview of the existing treaty frameworks, including their enforcement mechanisms. And the third expert meeting will focus on sharing lessons learned from recent and ongoing campaigns to establish new international treaties. For the first session today, we are very honored to have Professor Charles Jallo and Akila Radhakrishnan with us today both of whom I do want to stress are participating in their personal capacity. Uh, professor Jello is a professor of criminal and international law at Florida International University. He's the founding editor of the African Journal of Legal Studies and the African Journal of International Criminal Justice. He has twice been elected by the UN General Assembly as a member of the International Law Commission. Welcome, Professor Jello. 
And Akila Radhakrishnan, she's the president of the Global Justice Center, where she leads its work to achieve gender equality and human rights. In her time at the Global Justice Center, Akila has led to the development of groundbreaking legal work on both abortion access in conflict and the role that gender plays in genocide. Welcome, Akila. I will stop now to allow us all to benefit from their extensive knowledge. Akila, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Katrine, and to the McQuaggy Foundation for organizing this really important conversation. So I'm gonna, you know, ask a few questions of Charles to really get a idea around the process of treaty making, the role of the ILC. But as Katrine mentioned, we welcome you to add any questions and to chat if you have anything so that we can clarify any questions that you may have. So as a starting point, um, you know, to, to, to begin. So Article 13 of the UN Charter calls on the General Assembly to initiate studies and make recommendations for the purpose of encouraging the progressive development of international law and its codification. This in turn has led to the establishment of the International Law Commission, of which you're a member, to assist the GA in discharging this duty. Can you please elaborate a little bit more on this, including the ILC's mandate? Well, first of all, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to participate uh, in this important uh, discussion today. And it's a great delight uh, to be here with you, Akila, and of course, uh, Catherine, for your uh, kind introduction. I know that there are folks in the back who work to make this happen, in particular Erin and her team. So I want to thank them uh, for organizing and inviting me uh, to this discussion concerning uh, the role of the International Law Commission in particular within the context of the United Nations. Uh, of course, as uh, was already mentioned, um, I have the privilege of serving on the commission, but uh, appear here today in my, in my personal capacity. And the reason in part is because I believe that as members of the commission, uh, we have a responsibility to engage uh, with states, academia, uh, global civil society, and the wider public on issues uh, concerning our mandate and international law. Uh, that can of course be beneficial both for the members of the commission and um, those we hope uh, we engage with in terms of uh, stakeholders, whether it be states um, or civil society. Uh, turning now uh, to the question that Akila, you asked me uh, concerning the role of the commission. Um, well, the role of the commission is really uh, one that is rooted um, in the Charter of the United Nations. Um, the context, of course, is Article 13, as you rightly pointed out, uh, gave a responsibility to the General Assembly, uh, which is the uh, representative arm of the organization where all states uh, hold a seat. And it pro it's required under the Charter to uh, promote international cooperation in the political field. And as part of that, to initiate studies and make recommendations to states uh, with the view to encouraging the progressive development of international law and its codification. So for me, as a student of the charter, it is no accident really that states uh, mentioned in the same provision where they mentioned uh, international cooperation, they mentioned the idea of international law. And the reason is in part because states recognize that international cooperation works be better when they can agree on the rules of the game that would bind them. Uh, the second point, um, just in terms of context, is of course that charter responsibility now devolved to the General Assembly and the General Assembly considered the ways to give effect to it. So what they did was they convoked a committee of experts, uh, the so-called uh, committee of 17 eminent jurists to study um, Article 13 and to make recommendations uh, to the General Assembly on how we could give effect to that responsibility. So ultimately what it came down to was a proposal by the group of experts that the General Assembly set up a full-time international law commission that would be comprised of persons of recognized competence in the field of international law, uh, sitting either in their personal capacity as representatives of states. And ultimately, the wisdom of the General Assembly was that they will sit in their personal capacity, although they'll be nominated and elected by states. Uh, the members served for about five years um, in that role, 
and they meet in Geneva. We've been meeting in Geneva since the mid 50s and essentially work very closely with the General Assembly. So let, let me stop there for now. Thank you. And so maybe to dig a little deeper into the mandate, right? So as you mentioned, there's a sort of dual prong in the mandate to promote the progressive development of international law as well as its codification. And these are sometimes in tension with each other. So can you talk a little bit about how the ILC has approached this tension and potential ways to resolve this issue? Yeah, sure. Uh, so the first point, of course, is the point of departure. Uh, that you gave, Akila, which is the mandate of the commission in Article 1 of the Statute of the Commission. And essentially there, the uh, General Assembly directed the commission to have as its primary goal, the promotion of the progressive development of international law and its codification. And I stress uh, the word promotion because it's often missed by those who read the statute that there's expressed language mandating the commission to not only work on codification of international law, to not only work on the progressive development of international law, but to promote both of those aspects. Uh, of course, in terms of the thrust of your question, you are right that there is some kind of tension in this two-pronged mandate. And in fact, as a historical matter, uh, if you go back uh, to the records of the establishment of the commission, as I, ILC members sometimes do, uh, you'll find that there was a big debate um, in the Committee of 17, which proposed this format uh, to the General Assembly. And the debate centered on what exactly does codification mean and what exactly does progressive development mean. And essentially the way it worked out was you had this uh, proposition in the statute that would define, that states define the terms. And they said that for convenience, uh, codification would be uh, the preparation of draft conventions or treaties, if you like, on subjects which have not yet been um, regulated by international law or, or in regard to which the law has not yet been sufficiently developed. Sorry, that's the progressive development prong. I'm gonna be having it backward here. And the second prong, of course, the codification really referred to the precise or more precise formulation and systematization of rules of international law where you can find extensive state practice precedent and doctrine. So those two components of progressive development, which is the first one that's mentioned by the way, and defined, and the second bit codification really have been uh, items that the commission see as its guiding light in terms of the work that it does. Essentially, uh, the rest of the statute is a bit suggestive that these are two separate categories. They have distinct processes, you know, so only the General Assembly can make proposals for progressive development and the commission can make proposals for codification, recommend them to states. But the reality is a little bit more complicated and that came out in the debates in the Committee of 17 and in debates in the General Assembly. And that reality was one that the commission had to confront almost immediately. And ultimately what it came down to was uh, the commission found that it was very difficult to separate these two tasks because in fact, the two tasks are intertwined. When you go to codify something, and uh, the idea that you precisely formulate a rule of international law based on state practice and opinion juris, which is the fancy Latin you know, for, for international lawyers that says that they believe they're doing it because they believe that they're bound to do it. Uh, you, you end up deciding that you can be more precise maybe. And in that process, you make a little change, you propose a change. So to be effective for states, you have to be open to doing that. And on the other hand, in terms of progressive development, there may be areas where the law doesn't have a lot of practice, uh, but states need a rule in that area as part of a project. So essentially what it came down to in the end, in terms of how the commission deals with all of this, is that there was a tension in the mandate from the get-go the statute is suggestive of somewhat of a two different categories, but ultimately the categories really merge. And so the commission has developed what is called a composite view of codification, which essentially means that the commission will just look at the needs of the topic under consideration. And based on the needs of the topic, based on the type of practice that exists, it could then make all this as proposals to states for the states to determine whether they can take them forward. That's really helpful. And I want to get back to process in a minute. But first, I want to you know, talk a little bit about one of the key issues that I think we're facing now around international law. And that's the perception of who makes international law. You know, Traditionally, whether that's an ILC membership or state representation in diplomatic conferences, that's often largely men. Um, and many of the key human rights treaties that we think of are often regarded through a cultural relativ 
relativism lens as Western driven, right? So can you reflect a little bit on the composition of the commission in terms of gender, including in terms of gender, as well as the importance of engaging in inclusive processes for treaty making that put actors, specifically states from the global South into the driver's seat in order to better reflect the universalist aspirations of international law? And what are the benefits of such an approach? Um, I think it's a great question, um, Akila, because certainly if you uh, think of it from the classical view of international law, international law, it is a body of law for and by states, right? The classic view of international law is really that only states matter in the international legal order. Uh, but that view has definitely come under challenge, if it was ever true, since at least the beginning of the last century, uh, with the development, if you think about just right around the period uh, after World War I of the minority rights treaties in Europe. Um, the change, um, of course, wherein international law shifted to show a preoccupation uh, above and beyond uh, just states, including individuals and corporations and companies were really, really cemented uh, when we had the development of the UN Charter in 1945, uh, when states met because as part of the core goals of the organization, they recognized that to have humans, to have state security, you needed to have human security. So human rights were embedded in the charter itself. And we know what that led to eventually was that this extensive corpus of human rights laws, including some of the treaties that we refer to today, obviously starting with the Universal Declaration, which is a declaration and then kind of gave birth ultimately to the two conventions that we, be, we know about. And then all the subsequent efforts really centered on giving some kind of primacy and role for entities other than states at the international level, obviously from the point of view of conferment of rights. But if you return to states for a second, um, there are at least two elements to this, right? When you say states matter, even if you accept the classical doctrine, well, which states matter, right? Uh, the whole system, as we know it, at least since Westphalia, uh, was centered on the principle of equality of all states, right? Uh, but because of the history, we had this view that some states are civilized and some states are not civilized, right? The civilized states came, interestingly, from one part of the world for the most part, and the uncivilized were from another part of the world. And what all of this came down to in the end is that there had to be changes, if you think about international law, to accommodate the views of, of states in a more complete sense to ensure that all states uh, at the same time, at the same table, determining the rules that will bind them, irrespective of whether you classify them and, as Western and Christian and civilized or Muslim and uncivilized. And, 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 and so this is really a space where some organic changes have taken place by fiat of the charter itself. How does that play out in the UN in practical terms? Well, the UN makes efforts to be truly representative of the world. And we see that pattern in the relation to the International Law Commission. Uh, the commission was founded just before decolonization occurred. So it in initially was only comprised of about 50 members who were said to be uh, to have recognized competence in international law. They were to be nominated by governments and then elected by the General Assembly. But as the decolonization process took place, the 15 members were not sufficient to be representative of the world. So what you saw was a gradual expansion led by the states themselves of the membership of the commission to 25 members in 1961. And by 1981, we had 34 members, which is the number that we have today. Now, having said that, the increase in the membership of the commission really is meant to not only be re geographically representative, but to also reflect the main forms of civilization and the principal legal systems of the world. So they must come from all parts of the globe, but also we think about different legal systems. We think about common law, civil law, Islamic law, and so on. Ultimately, of course, when you go beyond that, uh, you would notice that the commission has had some challenges and because you raised the gender question, right? Uh, this is an area that the commission really reflects the type of institution that was born around World War II. If you think about the International Court of Justice, there's no requirement in the statute concerning gender. Well, you don't also have any requirements uh, for gender considerations to be taken into account in nominations and elections of members of the commission. So what you ended up having is a commission that has struggled to be really representative, not by fault of the commission, because the commission members do not elect themselves, they are nominated and elected by states. And states, of course, have taken on board 
this idea, which is a fairly more modern view, that we need to have gender representation. And unfortunately, despite some promises to put more women candidates forward as uh, for, for consideration by the General Assembly, even in the most recent election, uh, some women did not end up making it. So the record of the commission in terms of its composition is that since it was established and the first election took place in 1949, you've had about 238 men serve. And by next year, when the new commission comes in, we have new members who are coming in uh, for a, a term that lasts until 2027, you'll have about five women out of 34. And what that is really is a marginal increase of one woman uh, from the current number that we have, which is we have four women out of 34 in the commission. So definitely on the gender scorecard, the commission is not doing very well. Uh, but of course, as I said, this is an issue for states to take up, and there are definitely efforts by some states to put forward female candidates. This is a trend that I expect would continue. Having said that, the commission does still make some good contributions and is also aware of this issue. And you have members of the commission sometimes speaking quite strongly in favor of opening up the commission more. Let me stop there because I know you have more questions, Akela. <laughs> no, Charles, I think this is I think this is a super interesting conversation as well as we think about in the context of how do we fill gaps around sexual violence is, you know, who is bringing what considerations to the table as we think about the legal framework, I think is very important for all of us to be considering. And so I want to come back around to process now. You know, you started to describe a little bit earlier about you know, how the ILC goes about its work. So I want to ask a couple of questions that I think would be useful to the audience here. So how does the ILC decide what issues to take up for codification and progressive development? Does the ILC decide up front whether to prepare draft articles that it might ultimately recommend to the General Assembly for possible adoption of a treaty? Is there an assessment process that's used to decide if a particular issue should be resolved via a binding instrument or another non-binding form, such as draft conclusions or draft principles, which we're increasingly seeing from the commission? Um, well, it's a very good question with multiple elements. So let me try uh, to respond as best as possible. Uh, the first part, of course, is to recall that the ILC uh, can propose topics to states. So that's part of the formal mandate of the commission um, in the statute. Uh, the second aspect is to uh, appreciate that the commission does sit in the wider context of the UN system and therefore has relationships not only with the member states of the United Nations and the committees of the General Assembly, in particular, the sixth committee of the General Assembly. It also has some kind of formal role to play if other UN organs and principal agencies want to interact with the commission. So I'll start first then with the aspect about the commission, because that's one part of the puzzle, so to speak. And I'll speak in a moment about the second aspect that really, really center on member states, the sixth committee, and other organs and specialized agencies of the UN. Uh, on the first part, which is really the commission, and this has really been the source of the work of the commission for the most part over the past uh, 72 years, the commission has a rigorous multi-stage process um, to determine uh, what items to propose to states in what is called the long-term program of work. And the long-term program of work is to be distinguished from the current program of work of the commission. Now, if we focus on the long-term program of work, basically members or the secretariat of the commission can or be invited to make proposals on topics that they believe meet certain criteria under the statute. And in fact, the criteria has been fleshed out uh, by the commission is now fairly standard and essentially has a number of components. The first element is that the member or the secretariat will need to show that the topic reflects the needs of states in respect of the progressive development of international law and its codification. That's the first point. Secondly, the member needs to show that the topic is sufficiently advanced in terms of state practice to permit progressive development and codification. And thirdly, the topic must be concrete and feasible uh, for the commission to take it up. Uh, there is this other point, sort of like a loose criteria that the commission agreed not to restrict itself to traditional topics, but to also reflect and consider new developments in international law and pressing concerns of the international community as a whole. And this is that area where, for example, if you think about sexual violence, you would argue that this is a pressing concern of the international community, think about the environment and so on. Now, once the member puts 
a case up on these elements, it goes to the working group on long-term program of work. The working group works on the basis of consensus. It's normally about half of the members of the commission. You're not appointed, you volunteer to serve in it as with other bodies of the commission. And it's very difficult to find consensus, I could tell you, uh, having been through the process myself a number of times. And consensus effectively means almost unanimity. You gotta get all the members on the, of the working group on board. Definitely someone should, be, uh, should not be so unhappy that they're willing to block. And that will then constitute, if you get the consensus, a recommendation to another body of the commission called the planning group, and then ultimately goes to the commission as a whole. I don't want to get too bogged down with the minister of internal ILC processes, but the point is, once it goes to the commission and the commission agrees, it will notify that topic proposal in its report to the General Assembly, and that would then be the opportunity for CIS to comment on that issue. So I can come back to that aspect if it's of interest to anyone, perhaps in the Q&A. Um, I'll just say very briefly, perhaps, that there's a package of, set, uh, of entry points, so to speak, to the commission, which is the second route, so to speak. The first route is the ILC route. The first, second route is the, the state uh, uh, principal organs route. And in that area, basically, you have a whole host of possibilities where you could have the sixth committee making recommendations to the General Assembly to refer a topic to the commission. You could have UN agencies making proposals to the commission and so on. But I'm just going to stop there because I know that we might have other questions that would allow us to develop some of this further. Yeah, so you, you mentioned the six committee. So maybe let's talk a little bit about the role of the sixth committee, right? We started by talking about the mandate from the UN Charter for the role of the General Assembly in all of this. And for those who don't know, the Sixth Committee is the legal committee of the General Assembly. And so they're the ones that are in many ways tasked and have this um, relationship with the ILC. Um, and you know, in terms of treaties that come out of the United Nations, they play a really significant role in the development of that. Um, and you know, I think one of the questions that might be on people's minds as well is how long something like a treaty takes to develop with, you know, in working through the sixth committee, is there a faster route maybe as well? So I'll, I'll prompt you with a couple of those terms. Okay, thanks, Akila. So there are a couple of things actually. Let me start up with the last part, which is really concerning timelines. Um, so I'll be one of the first to admit that the commission is not famous for its speed, uh, but the ILC is famous for its deliberations and its quality work. So sometimes it takes a long time in its work. Um, and part of it, of course, is because the ILC is in constant dialogue with states, it's not just independent experts sitting in Geneva devising legal texts. Each time the commission would have small proposals that are sent to states for comments, and the commission receives comments on those in the annual debate of the sixth committee uh, set aside for the ILC report called International Law Week, which is a big festivity for international lawyers in New York uh, towards uh, the late October period. Uh, so it can take a bit of time um, to have a process through the commission. So time is definitely a consideration, uh, whether it's an item that's through the ILC route or through the state route. So, and you nudge me towards the sixth committee in particular. Uh, the sixth committee, of course, has an important role to play in, because it's the oversight uh, body for the commission. It's the one that's comprised of the delegates of states to which the commission reports. So there's a bit of a separation of powers, a separation of functions there. And the sixth committee can refer items to the commission. And I would say from the point of view of uh, items, statutorily, of course, uh, with the possibility of referrals from the sixth committee being exercised, the sixth committee can even request the commission to prioritize those issues. So in principle, it means that if you have the sixth committee on board and you can get, you get a proposal of a topic to the commission, the commission could be requested to prioritize that issue. That would ordinarily happen anyway if it comes from states. And that has been the practice of the commission in the past, because after all, the commission is there to work closely with states, to assist states in that role uh, to give effect uh, to Article 13 of the Charter. So that's a possibility that's there. What I can say is that that power has been used in the past. It was more used in the past. Recently, because of changes that are taking place in the Sixth Committee itself, especially this consensus rule, which is interpreted to mean unanimity, we haven't seen a referral of a topic from the Sixth Committee, to, from the General Assembly technically, but recommended by the Sixth Committee to the ILC. In fact, the last such referral was in 1994, when the General Assembly requested 
that the IOC prepare a draft statute for a permanent international criminal court. So the Sixth Committee Rod definitely does exist. And I'll just end on this note, uh, Akila, to say that it's not just through that entry point of the Sixth Committee that states can take forward an item. So for example, given the conversation we're having here, if someone, if a number of states, one or more states are interested in the issue of sexual violence in the context of armed conflict, they could be the ones that then make direct proposals to the commission. The statute allows UN member states to do that. Thanks, Charles. I think that's a really important point. And so, you know, we're talking about states, but I also wanna talk a little bit about civil society and how the commission engages with civil society and the role that you know, civil society actors like the McCleggy Foundation can play in the development of international law, right? In some ways, this goes to the, the classic question we started off about who makes international law, whose engagement is valued as well. And so let's maybe take the draft Crimes Against Humanity Treaty as an example. And for those who are not familiar, um, the, you know, the ILC has over the last um, decade been in the process of developing a draft treaty on crimes against humanity, which is now sitting with the UN Sixth Committee. And so this has been a, a bit of a representation of the process of what happens in the development of something like this. And, you know, I think shockingly to many people, there is no treaty on crimes against humanity, which we can get into later if we want to. But I bring it up here because I think it's one that's both of, you know, there was a high level of academic and civil society engagement on key issues, including related to gender in the development of the ILC's draft of the treaty. And it's also one that potentially overlaps with the idea of a convention on conflict related sexual violence by closing the gap on state responsibility to prevent and punish crimes against humanity, including sexual and gender based crimes, and includes key provisions to hold states accountable through dispute resolution at the International Court of Justice and duties to cooperate. So maybe could you discuss a little bit about the process of how the ILC engaged with civil society and how that can result in, you know, I think like positive benefits on issues like gender where we've seen progress in the last 20 years? It's a great question to think about the ILC and how it engages with civil society actors, uh, because ultimately, I think the point of departure is that the ILC is a state created institution and it primarily works with states uh, to assist them, right? That's the, the essence of the mandate of the commission and it's done that very well and assisted states greatly in developing uh, more than international law. We see the impact of the commission in a range of areas uh, where without the ILC action, one would be very doubtful that we have the clarity for states that we have now. So definitely some significant accomplishments on the part of the commission working with states. But having said that, um, it's not too surprising then if we take that point of departure of a state created and state focused body that it doesn't have too much to say in terms of the role of um, NGOs or civil society, at least in a formal sense, um, especially in relation to uh, identifying potential topics for the commission to consider. So here I'd like to make three points. The first point is that the the, the detail that you see in terms of how the ILC will interact with states or the General Assembly, the Sixth Committee, other principal organs is lacking. And there is no express provision that says that NGOs or civil society groups can propose or refer topics or even draft conventions for codification to the commission itself. Um, having said that, um, I tend to have the view uh, that the absence of a provision does not necessarily mean that they cannot, they are forbidden, prohibited from making such proposals. So for example, let's take the Mukwege Foundation. If you wanted to make a proposal of whether just the topic or a whole package of you know, provisions that constitutes what it thinks is the ideal treaty, you could send that to the ILC. Um, but then of course, it will be a matter for the ILC to decide whether it sees merit in that proposal. It hasn't hap happened uh, to my knowledge, again, in a formal sense. Uh, but of course, you mentioned um, the Crimes Against Humanity example, and in a minute, I want to talk about how the Crimes Against Humanity project as a whole actually did get inspiration from academia and civil society. So there's definitely a place uh, for those actors in terms of the possible influence they could have. Uh, what is clearer, so I just want to make this point in terms of the study before I develop that point a little bit further, what is clearer is that the commission itself is entrusted with the responsibility and it has a freedom of action to engage with NGOs, to engage with civil society. And it does that fairly regularly. 
So it does that in relation to also individuals. Sometimes experts are invited and we've had topics where, for example, on the issue of protection of the atmosphere, the commission had informal dialogues with scientists who are atmospheric scientists who would explain to us about the atmosphere in a way that we, the special rapporteur and the commission believed would be helpful in the project that the commission was engaged upon, which is to identify a set of uh, guidelines concerning the protection of the atmosphere. So definitely there is that engagement. So that's the first point that there's no formal entry point, but as a matter of practice, we do get a lot of interactions. Second point is this, um, and this is a, an important point in the sense of the connection between the role of civil society, not just for the ILC, but also for states as a whole. It was always the case that private bodies and actors have influence, right? They influence states already anyway. So if you think about the work of the International Law Association or the Institut de Droit International, these are all bodies that are famous, but they're private entities of jurists. They've been influential in shaping international law. They don't have that kind of dialogue that the ILC would have every year with states, but they do work that is generally very well respected and can be a source of inspiration. So that's already a very good thing. The other part of it is that we see NGOs taking up issues. Sometimes states are a little bit hesitant in those areas. We think about the landmines ban and the so-called Ottawa process, right? In the, in, in, the, in the 90s, we ended up having a 1997 Ottawa convention because we had the international campaign to ban landmines and a number of other NGOs taking up that issue and through their advocacy, putting it on the international agenda. So all this to say that NGOs can be, play a crucial role in terms of helping develop international law, we see that when they directly engage states, but we also see that, and this then brings me to my third point about the crimes against humanity draft, which is what you really pointed to as an example. And there I wanna make a couple of observations. So one is about the process side, right? When you think about how these issues get to the ILC, you're talking really about process, but there's also the substantive input that these entities make. So on the crimes against humanity initiative, um, there was a movement by a group of academics in the US, a good friend of ours, Professor Leila Sadat, uh, Washington University of St. Louis, that basically convened a group of global experts to talk about that big gap that you highlighted, Akila, that no one can believe that crimes against humanity does not have its own standalone convention. So they are like, okay, we've got to think about what to do about this. How do you come up with a draft that's credible? What are the issues? They worked on it and they produced this really, really important work and then suggested after they did their work that, hey, this is the kind of issue that the ILC should take forward. And it so happened that there was an American special rap, uh, American member of the commission who was willing to present this as a topic for the commission who ended up becoming the special rapporteur for the topic. And there you go, the ILC took up the topic, of course, after doing its own consultations and then sent it to states, got very, generally very positive feedback. And now we have in 2019, the conclusion of the draft articles. So process-wise, though formally there was no kind of NGO referral, we did see the influence of the work through an ILC member, and of course, the, the commission's own attention to the issue. And the issue now is at least formally before the sixth committee with a draft set of articles that are potentially going to help fill a gap if states decide to take them forward, right? So that's the one part. But let's talk about the substance, because the substance really is interesting from the point of view of the gender issue, right? We talked about the composition of the commission. Well, on substantive issues as well, you might have areas where, if you think about definitions of crimes, there are some challenges for international law. And in the Rome Statute, what you had is a definition of the crimes against humanity that was included, uh, that included a gender definition that was very heavily influenced by certain states uh, and states on you know, different parts in different parts of the world could agree on defining gender. They included, they convinced other states to include this definition in the Rome Statute in Article 7 in 1998. Uh, the statute entered into force in 2002, but since then, a lot of developments have taken place and we have a more nuanced understanding of gender. So when the ILC worked on the Crimes Against Humanity project and used the ICC definition of Crimes Against Humanity and included this gender component, the NGOs were awash with comments on this. Some states were awash with comments on this. And in fact, the number of NGO submissions and individual submissions dwarfed the number of state submissions. I mean, 700 NGOs are said to have signed on to documents that gave comments to the commission. And these were very helpful generally for the ILC's deliberations. And they took into account these submissions from states and the special rapporteur himself proposed that the commission drop the gender definition from the Rome Statute. 
I'm not going to say it's just because of the NGOs, because states did make these comments. And the second stage, of course, of the commission's work is really about reviewing the views of states. But there were states that were like-minded that had said the same thing. And I don't think it actually uh, undermined the, uh, the argument uh, and, made, um, and made it difficult, rather made it easier that you had so many NGOs saying the same thing as some states. And ultimately, the commission proposed some changes there. And that's gone to the Sixth Committee. And of course, we get the division between some countries that supported the change and those that didn't. But that's part of the process. It's just to say that as an illustration, that while formally, in the end, you don't have an entry point to the commission, but informally, there are lots of entry points to the commission and exchange between the International Law Commission, academia, and civil society. Thanks so much for that. So much for that, Charles. I do think it's it's important as we think about what are the gaps in the space and how do we continually develop the law as well, and you know take into account um, changes. We certainly were one of the NGOs that made a submission to the ILC on the gender definition, as well as actually other um, compromises that were perhaps made in the Rome Statute around issues related to gender. Um, so I'm gonna just I have one final question for Charles, but if anyone who's participating in the meeting has a question, please do drop it into the chat and I'll come back around to it. Um, so Charles, as we're, you know, kind of to conclude, you know, we're, 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 we've learned with multiple issues under the mandate of the ILC, including crimes against humanity, as we just discussed, but also universal jurisdiction, which I know is a topic of particular interest to you, the issue of immunities, the movement forward is hard and that it's slow. And that in the current political environment, fraught you know, as the McWege Foundation thinks about a potential treaty on sexual violence and possible processes for approaching, you know, filling gaps around accountability for gender-based violence, what lessons would you recommend that they consider? Well, you're right, uh, Kayla. I think uh, we are in an interesting uh, political climate internationally. Um, on balance, it seems to be getting better and better in terms of at least the expressed commitment of states to international law. Uh, we saw quite a bit of pushback and it's kind of like a pendulum that keeps swinging back and forth. So sometimes we are more committed than at other times. And we see, for example, what's happening in Ukraine, a lot of activity at the international level where states really re-emphasize the importance of international law commitment to international law. Having said that, I think that the timing is critical. So my first point, if you will, for consideration to the Mukwege Foundation or anyone really out there in terms of an interest in the issue of sexual violence in the context of armed conflict or as a means um, um, or, or method of warfare or any other project really is to think about what you push for and at what time. Um, and the reason for that is even though you might anticipate a particular outcome when you advocate a particular position, what you might end up having may not be what you push for, right? And you have to be open to the possibility that once you open the Pandora's box, um, the issue could run away into different directions. So the timing is very, very important. And you have to have a sense in my view of political commitment to actually carry through what you're proposing. So that would really be my first point. And I would just draw on this. We talked a lot about the crimes against humanity example. And that's one of the more recent examples. And it's a good example from other perspectives as well. It's a good example from the perspective of this was a process that started at the ILC by a member proposal, as I discussed earlier. But at the same time, that just around the same time, a couple of years or a year before that, a number of states, um, European states primarily, had indicated an interest in developing a multilateral legal assistance treaty in the area of core international crime. So the idea was, we see there's a gap in cooperation for the ICC. This is one of the Achilles fields of the institution. So why don't we have a new horizontal level treaty that would deal with uh, the co cooperation in a deep way? So that project started off and went in its own direction and the ILC started its own project. Now the difference is, of course, the ILC was just focused on crimes against humanity and in filling that gap, even though it did address as well the aspects of mutual legal assistance and expedition. Um, the other, the state's initiative was one that would include all the crimes, uh, but also address similar issues. So you ended up having two processes that were in parallel. And up to now, there's a little bit of confusion among states and other observers as to how then you take these two projects forward. So if you will, the reason to be cautious is also are quite important because you need to know what else is happening out there. 
And, to, and this then brings me to my second point, which is there is perhaps a understandable human tendency uh, for us to prefer what we do. So we might be working in our own areas and we have our own silo and we think of things from that perspective, but it's a little bit of a cliche, talk to each other and see who are the partners out there. Join forces with them. What are the other civil society actors that are interested in the question? What are the international organizations? What are the states that may be interested in that issue? Because if you join forces, for example, to address a particular theme, it is possible that you might have even more options as we saw in even the discussions about potential referrals of topics to the International Law Commission. When you have states backing you, it becomes a stronger initiative. And I'll just end on a final note, which is to say that this of course is nothing new. And I'm not one that would say, I would at any point discourage. I'm one who likes to, if you would push for strong rules on a lot of things, uh, because I firmly believe in international law. I drank that international law Kool-Aid. And there's no one in international law who does not know about in Henry Dunang and the International Committee of the Red Cross. There's no one in international law who doesn't know about Robert Jackson and his role in having us the president of the Nuremberg Tribunal. There's no one in international law that does not know about Raphael Lemkin, who helped us get the Genocide Convention, right? This is all laudable. It's individuals that led the processes and got states on board. And we, of course, just already talked about the landmines ban. So it's not just a historical thing. It happened even more recently. All to say that if there's an interest in any issue and you want to push for it, why not? But I would say be cautious, build the alliances, think carefully about it, and see and make sure that when you push for what you want, that you are able to get what you want. I'll end there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Charles. I think that, you know, is really going to provide some good things for everyone in this conversation to be able to reflect on. We have one question in the Q&A that I'm just going to pose to you here really quickly around the draft articles on state responsibility. Um, so, the um, you know, the, the person is asking, you know, what is the value in terms of strengthening the norms, even where there's perhaps not a formal process of instrument creation, or you're, you know, you're still in the process of perhaps moving towards an instrument, you're, you know, you're strengthening the normative framework, um, specifically in the context of state responsibility. Um, so let me make, a, it's a great question, first of all, uh, let me make a couple of observations. So one is a broad observation uh, that for the longest time, I think the success of the ILC was centered around the production of draft articles that states then take forward into some kind of convention, states in the General Assembly. We've seen that success in a number of critical areas of international law, the law of treaties, the law of consular and diplomatic relations, um, the law of the sea. Before we got UNCLOS in the 1980s, it was the four Geneva Conventions initially worked on by the ILC that set the benchmark. So we've seen a lot of important developments where you had binding instruments as the outcome. Those instruments would have been developed as draft articles in one form or another, initially at the ILC. What has happened now is there's a shift that's taking place. States are less and less interested in codification projects of that kind. So from the point of view of the ILC, what this has meant is that the ILC is now looking at principles, conclusions, guidelines, and the kinds of softer outcomes that states seem to want in certain areas. So that seems to be something that the ILC is doing to be responsive to the needs of states. So that's really just that first set of points that I would like to kind of meld together, the idea of articles and all of that. And then I want to go very quickly to state responsibility specifically. And that, that's the aspect about state responsibility was the IRC sent that as a recommendation to the General Assembly. This is the longest project in the history of the commission, almost 50 years. And the commission itself recommended that states think about it and not necessarily take it forward as a convention. So up to now, as a formal matter, the state responsibility articles are under consideration by the General Assembly. A decision has not been taken yet. Having said that, when you look at the world out there, the world of international law, international tribunals, government legal ministries, law firms, actors, NGOs, everybody cites the draft articles on state responsibility. The normative weight and influence of this work is quite significant to the point that there's even a study carried out annually by the Secretary General that maps how much the state responsibility articles are used as part of what states ask for to see what's happening out there in terms of state responsibility. All to say in, in answer to the question more specifically that you may have instances where you do not have a, a set of draft articles transformed into a convention, but there could be some normative weight attributed to that document. 
Uh, one has to be careful, of course, the state responsibility articles are somewhat different, but I think it's just to illustrate the point that the influence of the commission can be beyond having its own items transformed into a convention. Thanks, that's really helpful. And it's useful to think about as you think about the process of doing something like this, what are the points where what you produce and what you do can have utility, even if you're not at the end point that you perhaps had envisioned. There's one more question here. So the question is, how do successful treaties generally, oh, sorry, do successful treaties generally address a clear legal gap or are there examples of treaties that have been impactful despite there being existing international law in the arena, conscious that there's a reasonable amount of existing law on sexual violence? Well, it's, it's, it's a difficult question um, because a small codification has happened at the international level, including the area of international criminal law and in the area of international humanitarian law, We've definitely had a normative corpus of a body of rules and principles uh, that guide conduct. And so one could say that it's very hard to find areas where you have big gaps. The example of crimes against humanity is a specific example of core international crimes where you have the Geneva Conventions from 1949 addressing war crimes, including because they included grave breaches and then you had additional protocols in 1977, uh, you have the uh, Genocide Convention and those give clarity and stability to the definitions when it comes to the enforcement element in terms of giving effect to those in tribunals. Yet we did not have a Convention on Crimes Against Humanity, so the case for it is to fill that gap. Now it may be the case because we negotiated a recent instrument in 1998, we were able to address aspects of sexual violence and armed conflict that had not been addressed before, including the Rome Statutes Article 7, which are fairly progressive in some respects. Uh, there are new elements that were added. So I guess the question would be to turn it maybe back to the person who asked the question, of what do you see as the real reason to drive a process for a separate convention? Or could it be that you could, for example, join a particular effort? So what if you were to take up support for the Crimes Against Humanity draft articles and advocated for the pieces that you think are missing in the processes at the General Assembly, assuming a decision is made on those proposals. So I'll just stop there just to say that there may be creative ways to think about it without having a standalone instrument by, if you will, jumping on the bandwagon of something else that's already fairly progressive in addressing some of those concerns. Thanks, Charles. I think that's really clear. And I want to thank everyone for joining us in this conversation and for Charles in particular for very clearly explaining what I think is a very wonky area of the law, not easily understood. So thank you so much for doing that. And I'm going to turn things back over to Katrine. Well, thank you, Akila. Great job. Yeah. Hi. Thank you, Charles and Akila. I think for a very interesting, thought-provoking and uh, discussion which where I learned a lot and I'm sure all the other participants were able to to pick up on as well so thanks a lot again uh, to the audience maybe to say this was the first of the expert meeting as part of the McGregor Foundation's conference the next sessions will be on Monday there will be two and just a quick reminder the second session will be on the various existing treaty frameworks including enforcement mechanisms and the third session we will share lessons learned or better the experts will share their lessons learned with us on the various uh, treaty campaigns that existed so on that note uh, i want to close this session and thanks again charles and akila for sharing your thoughts knowledge and ideas thanks so much thank you so much thank you so much for having us Bye -bye.